continue this morning our exposition of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. We'll begin reading this morning in verse number 4. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 3. This morning we picked right up in verse number 4. And Paul is going to talk about how coming to Christ took him from pretense to power. A radically changed and transformed life. That is the result when somebody comes to Jesus. He makes them a new creation. He changes all things, not just a few things. He changes your heart. He takes up rule and reign on the throne of your heart. He changes your mind. You begin to think about the things of God and think about the Word of God and think about the love that you discovered in the Son of God. He takes over your body. You don't want to do the things you used to do. Thank God Jesus Christ makes us new. Amen. He sets us free. He puts our feet on solid ground and He establishes our going. Paul, from verse 4 down through verse number 11, is going to give his testimony of coming to Christ. He starts with his pre-conversion. He talks about what happened to him when he met Christ he talks about what his life is like now that he knows Christ. So beginning in verse number 4. Although I myself have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. This is before it comes to Christ. Looking back over my life before I came to Christ, if anybody wants to brag on how good they live before they came to Christ, I could probably outbrag him. That's what he's saying. Now look at the pedigree that he sets forth. He says in verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, a keeper of the law, an upholder of the law, as to zeal in verse 6, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. No one can accuse me of anything, he said. But whatever things were gained to me, this is what he means Christ. Whatever good those things were to me, whatever they were in my prophet calling, he said, I now, those things I have now counted as loss for the sake. Christ. More than that, verse 8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. There's nothing of any equal value. There's nothing of any greater value. There's nothing that comes close in value. Paul said everything else is lost. Everything else I've cast away. The one thing that matters most to me is that I might know Jesus Christ. And he uses the word know for intimate, personal, relational knowledge. He didn't want to know about him. He wanted to know him. He wanted to be in communion, fellowship, in relationship with him. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ, that I may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's what happened when He met Christ. Everything else got thrown out. The only thing that mattered was trusting in Jesus. So then He says that I may know Him again. Intimate, personal, this is gnosis, this is personal knowledge of Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. From pretense to power. Jesus gave two parables, the Gospel of Matthew in the 13th chapter. Beginning in verse number 44, one verse he gives the first parable. He says the kingdom of heaven, and when we speak about the kingdom, we're speaking about a king with sovereign rule over others. 
So in one sense, we can say that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that the heavens are the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that that other dimension where the Lord dwells, that heavenly dimension, it is His. He is Lord. He is King. He is sovereign. He is ruler over all. But what Jesus is speaking about in these two little parables is more specific. Everyone here, if you could picture your heart this morning in the shape of a throne, everyone has someone seated upon the throne of their heart. At one point, Jesus addressing the religious rulers, he said to them, you are of your father the devil. He is the God of your heart. He is the Lord of your life. He is your father. You are his children. But to those who came to Christ, who turned from sin and came to Him, suddenly as, as lightning flashes from the east to the west, He said, Satan's kingdom fell. And the kingdom of God was born. Christ took a rule of life on the throne of their heart. And Jesus says for that kingdom, to know Him as Lord, to be saved, if we can put it in the simplest of terms, he said, I'm going to give you two stories that will help illustrate the importance of knowing Christ as Savior. He said, first there was a man. And it appears that he was somewhat wealthy. But while he's out in the field, he finds a treasure. The greatest treasure that could ever be found. So he hides it, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 44. And he goes off and everything he possessed Everything he gained in life, everything that belonged to him, he sold it all. He got rid of everything so that he could go back and buy the field because that treasure meant more to him than everything else in life. Everything else just became something to be sold off, something to be gotten rid of, something to be cast away. The treasure was all that mattered. Friends, that's how important salvation is. And then to drive it home, Jesus immediately... In verse 45 and verse 46, he says, of the kingdom is likened to a man, a merchant, who gathers pearls. And he finds a pearl. It literally translates of the greatest value. The greatest value. Nothing in the world could be likened unto this pearl. And this man who has spent his life attaining pearls, he's got all these pearls, this wealth of pearls, he, he's, got, he's got this gigantic collection of pearls. He goes and sells them all, gets rid of them, does away with them, because the only thing that matters is getting whatever he has to get to attain the pearl of greatest power. There's nothing more important than the kingdom. There's nothing more important than knowing you are no longer the object of God's eternal, unquenchable wrath, but you are now the object of God's divine grace and blessing. There's nothing more important than eternity. And it hangs in the balance for every man, woman, boy, and girl in this world. It is appointed unto every one of us a time to die. And then the judgment. We will give an account for a holy God. And we are all together unholy. So if there is a way to be saved, from the wrath of God. It's got to be the most precious treasure. It's got to be the pearl of greatest value. It's got to be worth getting, giving up and getting rid of everything else that keeps us from that great treasure of His salvation. I like how the author of Hebrews just poses it this way. How in the world can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It's the most important thing. Everything else in life takes a backseat to the fact that we are eternal. Though the body dies, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. And it is appointed in every one of us, our bodies will die, but our soul lives on. The soul is eternal. The soul doesn't die. Where will that soul be for all eternity? Heaven or hell hangs in the balance. And if I can be saved, from hell. And that's the greatest thing ever. Jesus put it this way. In Matthew 16, he, he told his disciples, and he uses a, an all-inclusive term. This is everyone in the world. He said, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would come and get this salvation that I'm bringing, 
anyone three things. He said, Matthew 16, 24. Number one, let him deny himself. Nothing else matters. It's not about you anymore. You deny yourself. It's, it, it's, it's, it's as Paul says in verse 3 of our text here, no confidence in the flesh. I can't come to him saying, look at what trials you did, Lord. I have to come to him completely denying myself. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When Paul called himself the chief of sinners, that should be our call. We should all say, I am the chief of of sinners. I hear people say, well, I can't witness to this person or I can't witness to this people group. If that's you, then you have forgotten who you are apart from Christ. You are the chief of sinners. I am the chief of sinners. And the closer I get to Christ, the more putrid I see my own flesh. You've got to come to Him denying yourself. And He said, number two, take up your cross. Death to self. Coming to Christ doesn't mean you get hell insurance and then you go follow your dreams and do whatever you want to do in life. It means you come to Him, you bow before Him as Lord, and then you follow Him as the sovereign Lord of your life. You die. And you now live for Him. The old man dies. The old way of sin dies. The old folks call it repent. Turning from sin and self and everything else that dies so that you can become a new creature in Christ. And then finally, follow me. You come to Jesus Christ, you come to Him as the Lord. And friends, the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. They will either do it forever separated from God, crying in torment, Lord, Lord, or you can Humble yourself here and now and come under the Lordship of Christ. Be a part of His kingdom and spend eternity with Him. Praise Him. Lord, Lord! There's nothing more precious than salvation. There's nothing that, that means anymore. And Paul here, the reason I shared those two parables with you from Matthew 13 is because those are parables of transaction. Transactions took place. These two merchants, these two men... They had things in there, uh, as an accountant, you could understand this. I think we could all understand this. They had the profit <coughs> column, and they had the loss column. Before finding the pearl of great value, before finding the treasure in the field, if you looked in their profit column, there would be all kinds of things there. But when the man finds the treasure, suddenly everything that he thought was profitable, it got moved to the loss column. He sold it off. It wasn't of any value anymore. And the only thing in the profit column was the treasure. The man who found the pearl of great value, suddenly all the other pearls that were in his profit column sold them, got rid of them. They were lost. They didn't matter anymore. He, he sold them all off because the only thing he wanted in his profit column was the pearl of great value. And as Paul gives his testimony here in Philippians 3, he speaks as an account. He speaks as someone who, who maybe sits down on a Friday evening and you've got your check and you sit down and you write out the amount. That's your profit column. And then you start with the damages, the loss. The electric bill, the water bill, the gas, the groceries, the stuff that the kids need for school. All that loss that takes away your profit. And that's how Paul speaks here in verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, he said, those things I have counted Loss for the sake of Christ. And again, he's using the count in terms. The word gain is keredos. It's elsewhere lucre. It speaks of, of wealth or profit. The things you would have in your profit column. And then he speaks of loss. Zamia. It literally means damages. Loss. Detriment. Those things that are against you. And so Paul is using that language here the language of an accountant, and he's going to give us a testimony in accountant terms. I'm going to give you three things quickly. Paul begins in verse 46. <coughs> and before he came to Christ, if you would have asked Paul, if today is your appointed day to die, and you stood before a holy God, would he allow
allow you into his eternal kingdom. Paul would have said yes. And he would have got out his little sheet of paper. And he would have said, I can buy my salvation. Look at what I've attained in this world. Look at what I've gained in this world. Look at my prophet column. So this is his prophet column before he met Christ. He gives a pedigree of pretense. It was false. It wasn't good enough. It was a shame. It was hypocrisy. This is what real hypocrisy is. Paul said, if I stood before God, before I came to Christ, I just knew that I would be given the gift of eternal salvation because, look at me. He says, I was, a, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, one of the more elite tribes of the Israelites. I was circumcised the eighth day. I was born a Jew. We're God's chosen people. Circumcised the eighth day, kept the law from childhood. He said, as far as the law goes, I'm right up here. I'm a teacher of the law. I'm an upholder of the law. I'm a Pharisee. He's giving his pedigree. He said, when it comes to the law, accusing people in public, try to accuse me. I'm blameless. You know, when some people give their testimony, it's, I used to drink, and I used to smoke, and I used to you know, smoke weed, and I used to do drugs, I used to do all this stuff. Not Paul. I was raised in the best family. I learned under Ken Lane. I went to the best Jewish schools. I'm a Pharisee. I was it. Capital IT. He has the ultimate pedigree. If you were to think, who's God's chosen people? If you point the pulse right there. He said, even when he said when it came to zeal, how passionate was I for my religion? He said, this is how passionate I was when this church sprung up teaching this different way. I went out and persecuted him. And he fought for what he believed in. He put to death those who opposed his religion. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way. Spurgeon said, every man, woman, boy, and girl in the world are Armenian by nature. Here's what he meant by that. We all think we can work our way to heaven. We all think we're good enough. We all think we've done enough. We all think we have a pedigree. But in reality, it's a pedigree of pretense. Because all that have seen have become short of the glory of God. None righteous. No, not one. But you know what? Paul wasn't the only one. If you go back to the very beginning when sin entered in, what did Adam and Eve do in Genesis 3, 7? And they sewed fig leaves together to make a cloth to try to cover the shame of their sin. And that is the pedigree that men have been setting forth in the dawn of time. What can I do to be good enough to get to heaven? And you say, this is Paul, this is not people today. I would beg to differ. I would argue that there are people walking around with their own pedigree of free things today. And here's what they'll tell you. I was born in a Christian home. I was raised with conservative Christian values. And I've kept those conservative Christian values my whole life. I, I, I do good deeds for others. I give to charity. I, I help my neighbor. I, I've committed my life, some people, to social justice. They've done good deeds. They come from a Christian home. They've got religious zeal. They'll serve on committees. They'll volunteer to help. They'll, they'll do whatever they need to do. They've got religious zeal, just like Paul. And they've got plenty of religious works. How do you know they're going to heaven? Well, I signed the card and joined the church. Or I got baptized. Or I, 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 was, I partook of communion as a baby. And, you know, just one thing after another. They, they set forth their pedigree. But that's a pedigree of pretense. You know why? Romans 3.20. For by works, no human will be justified. By the works of any law. Whether it's God's law, whether it's man's law, whether it's our own self-made moral law, no human will be justified by God. He will stand guilty if he thinks his works will get him down. Paul 
writing to the Galatians in 2.16 says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Galatians 5.4, listen, you are severed, <coughs> torn away from, cut off from Jesus Christ. You who think you can be justified by works. You can't be. It doesn't matter the home you came from, the parents you have. Those are all blessings and those are all means that God uses to get the gospel to children. God may have raised you, He may have allowed you to be born into a Christian home. But if that's what you're trusting to get you to heaven, oh, I'm heartbroken for you today. That's not enough. No pedigree will ever be good enough in standing before a holy God. It's just a pedigree of pretense. It's just your fig leaves that you're hiding behind. Righteousness. Self-righteousness. Paul looked at his prophet column before he came to Jesus. He saw a big picture of Paul. This is how I know I'm getting to heaven. This is how I know I can attain salvation. This is how I know I'll be in the kingdom. Just look at me. It's all self-righteousness. But then, on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. How many of you have ever had a Damascus road experience? You met the Son of God. And when Paul met the Son of God, he went from a pedigree of pretense to repentance from the rubbish. Notice what he, he says again in verse 7 through 9. Here, here's, here's the summation of what Paul says in verse 7 through 9. He said, but when I met Jesus, and I looked at all my self-righteous, religious, living, and activity, and morality, and my prophet Paul, suddenly, I moved it over to damages. I moved it over to loss. I didn't want to look at it anymore. The only thing I wanted in my prophet Paul, was the righteousness that it takes to spend eternity with God. He says the righteousness that is a gift from God when I trust in Jesus. The perfect life Jesus lived, completely fulfilling all the law of God, that's righteousness. And that's what God demands for anyone to spend eternity with Him. And Paul said, when I put my faith in trust, when I took me out of the prophet column and I put Jesus there, God gave the gift of Jesus' perfect life to me so that when I do stand before God, He doesn't see Paul. He sees me clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Suddenly, the only thing in His prophet Paul is Jesus. That's the only thing that he, that he holds. That's what He believes in. That's what He trusts in. And, and, and listen to this. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance brings salvation. Godly sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Repentance, metanoia is the word. It means a change. A change of mind. When Paul met Jesus, he changed his mind. He no longer thought he was good enough to get to heaven. He knew that he was the chief of sinners and desperately needed a Savior. And instead of trusting in himself and his religion and his religious works and his morality and his charitable deed, instead of trusting in anything else, Paul said, I've changed my mind about me. I'm not all that in a bag of potato chips. I need Jesus. i got to turn to him. And listen, friends, when you change your mind, but you're not going to trust in you or religion or religious activity anymore, but you're going to trust in Jesus. He doesn't just change your mind. He changes everything. He changes everything about you. Suddenly, self-righteousness goes to the lost column. And the righteousness of God that is a gift by faith in Christ is in the prophet column. And you know what Paul says? He says, now let me back up a minute. Let's rewind of the tribe of Benjamin, born an Israelite, circumcised the eighth day, keeper of the law, a, a Pharisee among Pharisees, with zeal persecuting anything that come against the Lord. I was it. When I look at my life, apart from Christ, I take all of that and I count it as rubbish. The word rubbish, we see translated rubbish.
verse here is skubala. Skubala. It was used to speak of a couple different things. It was used to speak of wretched food that you would need so they threw it out to be trampled under men's feet and be eaten by dogs. It was used to speak of garbage that was thrown into Vienna and burnt. And it was used to speak. How many of you all were in farm country? How many of y'all have ever been out on the farm? You ever been out in the field? And you're running around, and suddenly you step on something that goes squish. And you smell the wonderful aroma <coughs> that comes from animal excrement. Dumb. That's another way they use this word. Paul says, and I looked at all my religious activity, and I stacked it up next to Jesus. Suddenly, all of my religious activity was dumb, garbage, good for nothing. Waste, damages. It went to the lost God. And, and he said, I got rid of it all. Because the only thing that mattered was the surpassing brilliance that comes from you know Jesus. Jesus was all that mattered. And then he says, Thank God, listen, friends. I keep saying this over and over, and I pray we all get it. Coming to Christ is not getting hell insurance, coming to Christ is Him changing you. Paul says in, in, in the, the concluding verses, 10 and 11, he says, not only did I receive the gift of the righteousness of God by faith in Christ, he said, but I come into partnership with his power. Partnership. A place. A partnership. A partnership of power. Let me just sum it up by saying this. When we genuinely repent and we are broken and sorrowful over our sinful, arrogant lives that thought we were good enough to get ourselves to heaven, and we turn to Jesus. God, by His grace, makes us a new creation. He doesn't just give us a hell insurance card and say, now you live however you want to live. He changes every point and part. And I love how Paul says, I became a partner with his death. When you turn to Christ, and listen, it doesn't matter what you did prior to Christ. You could have unnatural affections. You could have been a raging alcoholic. You could have been abusive to your family. You could have been a murderer. His grace is greater than all of our sins. Amen. The person I was before I came to Christ, I entered into a partnership with his death on the cross when I came to him. Here's what that means. The old man I used to be was nailed to the cross. He's dead. Brother, uh, Brother Dennis Whitaker used to sing a song saying to come here looking for me, but I had to tell him that old man don't live here. All of my failures, all of my sins, all, everything in my life that was an affront to a holy God, it's dead. I heard Paul Washer say something that just really resonated in my heart. I thank God that we live, uh, that we are part of, that I get to live this life as a part of this church. Because you all love the Lord and you love His Word. And you all, like me, understand and know and believe we have a high view of God here. We start with a high view of God and we keep it through everything else. That's why we believe what we believe and that's why we do what we do. We've got a high view of God. And we understand that He is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But don't ever lose a high view of the love of God. I don't care how wretched and putrid your life has been. You come to Jesus, he'll nail that to the cross. He will kill that old man and he will make you a new creation. Amen. Amen. And listen, you're not just a partner with his death. I love this. This one makes my leg wiggle like my dog when it scratches belly. <laughs> you become a partner in the power of his resurrection. Amen. I don't have to worry about cleaning my life up. 
Because the same spirit, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. The resurrection power of God the Holy Spirit comes to live within the believer to raise us up from the ashes of sin and degradation we used to live in, sets our feet on solid ground, makes us new creations, and empowers us to now live for the glory of Jesus Christ. Somebody said the Christian life is hard. It's not. It's impossible. But with God all things are possible. And He comes to live within you. You become partners with Him in the resurrection. Folks say, well, I come to church, but I just don't think I can. Don't worry, you can't. But you get Him in you, He can. There's nothing He can't do. Well, I've just got this addiction and I can't get over it. You need some resurrection power. <coughs> you need the same power that rose Jesus from the dead to get hold of you. Well, I've just got this hang up that I, I can't get rid of. This anger, this greed, this envy, this jealousy. Get some Jesus. Amen. Get some resurrection power in your life. Same power that rose Jesus from the dead. We become partners with that resurrection. And listen, we have already attained the resurrection. Now we're going to look next week. Paul says, not that I have already attained, but I press towards the mark. He, we're, going to, we're going to go through that and get an understanding of that. But here's what I mean. When I came to Jesus, as old folks used to say, I got born again. They put a D on the front of it. They wanted it to be real good. I got born again. You know what it means to be born again? It's regeneration. You were dead. You were made alive. Resurrected. Regenerated. Born again. And Jesus said, we can't do that. We can't be born by the will of the flesh. I can't cause that to happen. It's not by the will of man. Somebody else can't cause me to be born again. It's not by blood lineage. I can't be born born again. By the Spirit of God. And he said the wind, the Spirit of God is like the wind. You can't see Him. Guess what? He's here this morning. You can't, He's not tangible. You can't taste Him or touch Him or, or, or smell Him or see Him. Jesus said that just like the wind blows through the trees and you see Him sway over, you can look around and the people of the Holy Spirit has changed. You can see the change in their life. Amen. He changes you. You don't have to keep living how you live. You don't have to keep going the way you're going. There is resurrection power that fills the believer in Jesus Christ. I pray this morning that, that, that I want you to listen. I want you to just ask yourself this question. I pray this morning. You hear me? Ask yourself right now, just in your own heart, if today is my day to die, I stand before God. And I were to be asked the question, why should I let you in my eternal kingdom? What would your answer be? What would your answer be? Now, if you just answered in your heart and you said, I've been a good person. I've been baptized. I, I joined the church. I prayed a prayer when the preacher called me to. I, I, I'm a faithful giver. I'm good to my neighbors. I, I, I don't hurt anybody. I don't charity. If you, you start listing off your pedigree, friend, that's pedigree of pretense. That's hypocrisy. That's hiding behind your feet letters. Your answer should be one word. Oh, Jesus. Why should I allow you in my kingdom today? I was Jesus. But here's the cool part. I don't have to say it. Because when I die, you all roll this body over the hill or stick me in a, uh, a bucket or whatever you want to do with me, but I won't care once I'm gone. Because for me to be absent from the body, I'm going to be in the presence of my Lord. And I won't have to give an answer. Because when I die, I am transported to that heavenly dimension. I won't utter a word. Because seated at the right hand of God is Jesus Christ and He will stand up on my behalf. And he will say, this one's dead is paid in full. This one is clothed in my righteousness. This one belongs to us. Because He's our Redeemer. 
He's my defense attorney. And he paid my debt for me. Thank God for Jesus Christ. The most important thing in the world is knowing you're saved. There'll be times we come in here going through a book we're going to talk about marriage and we're going to talk about kids and we're going to talk about work and we're talking about giving and we're talking about loving our dad, all that other stuff. But friends, that don't mean nothing if you ain't saved. If you have, as, as the old folks used to say, you've got to be washed in the blood. If you've never been washed in the blood. If you've never turned to Christ. If there's anything in your prophet calling with Jesus, you need to be saved. And I want to plead with you. I want to compel you. I want to beg you to come to the Lord Jesus today. I want to beg you to deny yourself. It ain't about you anymore. It ain't about how good you live or what you've done. I want to ask you to crucify yourself. Take up your cross and say, I ain't worried about me anymore. And follow Him. Come to Him as Lord. Come and bow your knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord. And He gave in His eternal, inerrant, infallible, inspired word this promise. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. He never turned anybody away. Come to that. They're going to come and bless us with another...